Our scripture reading for the evening will come from the book of Exodus chapter 32. In the main, but we will begin it from Exodus chapter 31. I'm just going to assume everyone's left their Bibles at home and keep it moving. Exodus chapter 31 from verse 18. Originally, the Bible did not have chapter divisions. This was just done for human convenience and to make it easier to navigate. Um, So I'm going to uh, operate in that spirit today. Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. And he gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. A few verses later, Moses has been told what the people are doing and comes down to see them dancing. And Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you have brought such a great sin on them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, and they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they came and gave it to me. And I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them broke loose, break loose to the division of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. Verse 35. Then the Lord sent a plague to the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron had made. A little bit of context before we find out how baby cows have turned into the people or the person that brought the Israelites out of Egypt. The Israelites leave Egypt having met this new God after having been in bondage for 400 years and having been introduced to the pagan gods, animal gods, half-human gods, mixed, interesting-looking creature gods that the Egyptians worship. They need not only a reorientation in how to be a free people, but a reorientation in how to be a holy people. So God spends time creating an environment and a place and raising up a priest and a prophet who will lead them not only into the promised land, but into the holy land and a covenant with them. God ensures a few things are in place. One, he removes them from both physical and spiritual bondage in the land of Egypt. You cannot call a bound people into a covenant that requires free people. So God sets them free. In chapter 16, God does not want people to make a covenant with him out of hunger or out of desperation. does not politics of the stomach, I hear comrades saying. He does not want them to engage with him starving or not in possession of their full senses. So he says, I'm going to give you manna. I want to eat. God does not want the people to enter into a covenant with him delirious from thirst. So he makes water come out of a rock and lets them drink. God does not want them to enter into a covenant with him terrified or afraid of their enemies. So in chapter 17, they defeat the Amalekites. Now that they are open and available, their physical needs having been met, feeling confident and unafraid that God will defeat all their enemies, full of manna, thirst satisfied by fresh water, God says, all right. Let's talk. It begins in chapter 19 when God invites them into a covenant. It pauses for a moment in chapter 20 with the Ten Commandments and all the way through chapter 24 with various laws about the observance of of commandments, interactions with others, even laws on slavery, and so on and so forth. In chapter 25, God then begins with the construction of this thing known as the sanctuary. 
He spends a lot of detail discussing what the sanctuary must look like, how it must be decorated, who must build it, what must go into it. Chapter 25 deals purely with the design of the sanctuary itself, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of bread, the lampstand. In chapter 26, the tabernacle alone is dealt with. Chapter 27, the bronze altar, the courtyard, and the oil of the lamp. In chapter 28, an entire chapter is dedicated to the priest's outfit. Hashtag drip is forever, right? <laughs> the ephod of gold, the precious stones, the finest linens, his crown and what must be written on it, made only by the finest and by the very best. And God does not make generic garments. He says, call your brother Aaron to you and make these clothes for him. In chapter 29, the Bible deals entirely, again, only with Aaron and his consecration. These are the animals you will kill. These are the oils that will go here. And these are the ways in which you will slaughter these animals. And the fire must look like this. And the altar must do that. And so on and so forth. Two chapters and counting based entirely on Aaron. In 30, the altar of incense, the anointing oil. In 31, we are told who the artisans or the tradesmen that will do this work will be, Aholiab and Bezalel. In chapter 32, here comes this baby cow out of nowhere. The Bible spends about six chapters preparing Aaron for his calling. Aaron abandons it, betrays it, and desecrates it in less than six verses. There are a few notes I would like us to make about the calling and the purpose to which Aaron was called. Number one, the calling does not erase his memory. The things that Aaron witnessed and saw, the building of, of sculptures and the building of gods and the building of statues and false gods that he saw, he has not forgotten. He remembers enough about Egypt to be able to construct almost from memory the exact composition of the calf's legs, its belly, its back, its ears, how to make it structurally sound and to help it stand, how to fashion it with a graving stool, how to melt gold and make sure it reaches the right temperature but it's not too hot that he can't handle it or too cold that it won't stand up and hold the structure that he would like. The calling does not erase these memories. The things that we did before we were called remain. It requires a constant fight and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to help us move past it. We are not free from sin when we are called. We are free from slavery to it, but we must fight bondage. That we are called and have graduated does not end our struggle. The sins and the struggles that you had here at Helderberg will follow you out into the real world. It is a fight that you must constantly strive to study, to show yourself approved, to work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. It does not stop when you get out of those white gates. The next point I would like us to make is that the calling is by grace and it is only by grace that even after the betrayal of Exodus chapter 32 that God accepts his offering in Leviticus chapter 9. It is by grace that we do not become arrogant and that we do not boast. That we do not forget that it is him who calls us, that it is him who bids us, that it is him who enables us and it is him that ultimately has the power to remove us should we forget. The next point I'd like us to make is that Aaron's physical labor only begins once the temple is actually up. And the labor that he is called to do is to intercede for the sins of the people and to offer sacrifices for them. Considering how much the Israelites sin, Aaron should have just sacked chapter 32 out. He is going to be busy and on his feet until his dying day. Aaron's betrayal of his calling requires much more work than the effort of the calling. The betrayal of his calling requires more work than the calling itself. For his clothes, Aaron had tailors. For his office, Aaron had God himself as architect. For human resources, Aaron had Christ himself as his line manager. Bezalel and Aholiab would construct the equipment, his food, his portion would come from the Israelites. Aaron had to do nothing. There were people who were called to make sure that he was fully clothed. There were people who were called to make sure that his crown was taken care of. There were people that were called to make sure that he never went hungry or went thirsty. There were others who would mix and create the instruments for his labor. He was even called, or people were even called to ensure that Aaron's underwear 
was taken care of, down to the very nitty gritty, to the detail of covering everything that was involved with Aaron. Aaron, however, in his betrayal, does more work in those six verses that God had assigned to him in the preceding six chapters. Aaron calls the people. Aaron builds the calf. Aaron starts the fire. Aaron must melt. Aaron must call the feast. Aaron even goes in above and beyond what the Israelites had asked him for and builds an altar. Aaron is extremely busy when God has called him to do absolutely sweet bugger all, nothing. All you need to do is show up to the day of the consecration, stretch out your arms, raise your head, someone will crown you, someone will clothe you, someone will wrap your calvins around your body, someone will put a robe on top of you and fasten it, and the clothing that is described is for glory and for beauty. God does not just make Aaron look important, God makes Aaron look good. God cares about how Aaron feels. God cares about Aaron's hygiene. God cares about Aaron's etiquette. God is concerned absolutely and completely with Aaron's calling. But he does more work in those six verses, desecrating, disrespecting, and disobeying God's calling on his life than God had called him to do in the preceding six chapters. All Aaron had to do was to sit and wait. Disobedience, contrary to popular belief, takes a hell of a lot more work than obedience. And everywhere we look in the Bible, God tries extremely with a lot of patience to show us how much effort it takes. When Saul loses his crown in the book of Samuel, he has to sacrifice the animals himself. Had he just waited for Samuel, all he would have had to do was, was wait. Then he spends all of his time hunting down David and trying to kill him and destroy him. David was going to take his throne anyways. All he had to do was wait and relax. Similarly to the way that Aaron betrays his calling, so do the people. It is painful to read when you read in the last verse of chapter 31 that the very last thing that God had said to Moses was, I want you to call the people into Sabbath. When God stops speaking to Moses, he stops speaking and ends the address to Moses on the note of rest. The last six verses of chapter 31 are not about work or about offerings or about how the people are to build their tents or go to war or observe this or build that festival or create this, that or the next thing. The Bible says when God was finished speaking and he had finished speaking on the end of rest. Imagine being called to rest in the coolness of your tents but wasting time dancing around in the sweltering heat. It takes much more effort to betray our calling than it does to honor it. It's also interesting that the Israelites say that when they saw that Moses delayed, delayed how? According to what timetable? What was the rush? The Israelites have been in bondage for 400 years. Moses has been on the mountain for 40 days. Where on earth are you rushing to? Do you know the way? Did somebody come down and say, oh, by the way, so if you just take a left, don't rush. left, Then you'll be there. You'll see on your right, there'll be etc. Where is this massive place that you're rushing to? Not a few chapters ago, you're ready to go back to Egypt. And by the way, the Red Sea is now closed, so you're going to have to sail over it. But now you're in a rush to get to the promised land to do what? To go where? Where does this timetable that we have given the Lord, where he sat down and said, this is where you must go, this is what you must do. And we're in this massive rush. You have no idea how long you're going to live. Lord, I'm 20 years old and I'm not married. Who said you're going to live long enough to get married or not get married? And how do you know? Maybe this husband you're waiting for is going to shorten your lifespan by stress. Maybe let that brother take his time, wipe you out when you're in your 60s. Stop fasting and fretting. Lord, I want babies. You don't know if you will survive childbirth. Wait, relax, take it easy. It's 40 years to go. You have a lot of time. No, Lord, I want to get out of here and I want to get a job and I want to be in management. I want to work. I want to be an adult. I want to be able to buy my own house. Have you ever paid a bond? It's not a bond. Feels like not expensive that thing is. Lord, I want to get a car and so on and so forth. It's all fun and games until that first six thousand rand leaves your account. Lord, I want to get insurance and so on and so forth. Fun and games. Titombo when he comes up and says, "Yeah, the petrol price will be rising by a rand eighteen cents tomorrow." Where on earth could you possibly be rushing to? 
it is even more painful because the Bible does not say that the Israelites start rebelling in the middle of the instruction. The Bible does not say that the Israelites start building the golden calf at the beginning of God's address. The Bible says, and when the Lord was finished, he was done. They sinned when he was done. Moses was standing up, had been given the tablets, was coming down the mountain. It was finished. They gave up. They got impatient when it was done. HR has picked up the phone. They're about to call you. The TOC is happy to welcome you into its service in the next week. It is done. Good morning. This is Michael from Ernest and Young. When would you be available to start? It is done. Moses is standing up. He has the tablets. He is walking down the mountain. It is not in the middle of the address. It is not at the beginning. They are finished. At the end of their patience, beyond that which they can bear, the Lord is finished. The Bible is faithful and God is true. He will never give us more than what we can handle. As they begin to get tired and frustrated, somehow God knows that my people are now weary. They would like me to come and address them again. And he releases Moses to go back. We do not disobey very far from home. The Adventist church is not struggling with the things that it is struggling with far from home. We are not betraying the health message far from Christ's returning. We are not struggling with increased rates of moral, immorality and sinfulness far from home. We have not started this new trend of going out to restaurants on Sabbath far from home. We have not started this new trend of vacations of people who are unmarried far from home. We have not started refusing to return tithe because there is a recession far from home. We are not beginning to betray the observance of the, of the Sabbath day very far from the Sunday law. We are not far from home. Christ is not far from returning. We are betraying our mission at the gates to, the hev- to heaven. The very last tranche of commandments that God had given the people was the rest or to come in to their rest and no longer enter labor. But finally, I not, do not want to only address the graduates themselves or those who are called to leave Helderberg's gates. We also need to talk about what on earth you did to these kids. They are all either crying or deeply emotional. I have never seen happier graduates in my life. What stress did you put them through? for the last four years. I do not want to leave the church unscathed as I sit down. I think I've been up here long enough. You are not meant to execute your calling on your own. Aaron is by far the better speaker, but Moses is by far the better leader. Where Aaron fails, Moses intercedes. Moses, or or Aaron rather, is not the only priest. There's a whole tribe of Levites that are called to serve along with him. It is not possible to make it work or to bring about the vision or the fullness of the vision for God's church on your own. Aaron would not have survived or coped. This should both comfort the called and keep them humble. It should also remind the communities to which these people are called to serve that we must intercede first and judge later. Our pastors, our accountants, our human resource managers, our psychologists, and all the graduates that leave Helderberg today do not leave perfect. The atmosphere here, no longer, be, no matter how beautiful, is not beautiful enough to impute holiness or purity. The food here, no matter how nourishing, is not enough to clean their blood of any generational issues, sins, curses, or patterns that they might have. No matter how many sermons they have had from how many great speakers, it is not enough to write the law on their hearts. Communities must exist to support them, to pray for them, to intercede first, and to judge second. Send me, O Lord, to Mamin.